welcome um this is a mobile and wearable research uh, paper imt4306 and this lecture is about the future of mobile computing the lecture consists of two parts the first one is more generic we will discuss some of the generic mobile computing concepts in high level and then we will talk about the future what the mobile computing will be used in a few years time so we will try to predict of where the technology is heading and where the society is heading with the use of this technology um, so in the second half of the lecture we will introduce two concepts and i will give you some reading to do before the, the meeting during the lecture. So th this lecture is to, to be watched and I will pose some questions and then we will discuss those questions during the actual lecture on Thursday. Um, so let's start. Um, the first part is what is mobile computing? All right, so what do you think? What do you think mobile computing is all about? What is the essence of mobile computing? Um, mobile kind of originated from the portable telephony systems. So when you say, when we say mobile, we typically think about mobile communication. Uh, and it has started long time ago in you know, late 40s. Uh, we had portable telephony systems uh, they were pretty big but they evolved and we had huge progress in the recent years in miniaturization and in capabilities of those mobile phones and here um, on the right we see the Neo uh, OpenMoco handset one of the very uh, interesting designs open hardware and open software um, initiatives to provide mobile communication and mobile computing to, to masses. Um, that, that design actually coincided with uh, the release of the first iPhone, um, so they were quite close with, with, within the release dates. But mobile computing also means actual computing, right? So laptops. Um, but we, we see the you know, recent tablets are more portable and more capable than the original laptops that, that we used to have. Um, so this concept of mobility is, is changing and evolving as the technology develops. And there is a, you know, huge push for smartwatches and for other forms of wearable infrastructure, which makes it even easier for people to, to use this type of technology. And that technology is becoming uh, exceptionally powerful. So if you, if you check some of the facts, for example, what's, what's included in the latest iPhone 7, uh, you will find that there is an A10 CPU. Uh, it's actually a system on the chip. So it's not just the CPU. It's um, CPU networking and GPU kind of built in into a single die of silicon. But if you compare the uh, high performance cores on A10, which is in the iPhone 7, and compare the Broadwell processor from MacBook Air, um, the previous generation MacBook Air, you will see that they pretty much the same. Um, the performance of the mobile CPU is almost as good as the MacBook Air CPU from Apple, uh, from Intel. Um, so there, there is, there has been a huge progress in achieving computational performance within the form factors which can fit in to portable devices like smartphones, and in the future probably smartwatches as well. Um, a little bit more about the A10. A10 is a very interesting chip. Um, so as as we know, one of the 
fundamental differences between desktop or cloud computing and mobile computing is the battery. Um, so the battery life is one of those factors that differentiates mobile from anything else. And the question here is, how can we mitigate it? How can we make this not to be factor anymore? Um, we will discuss it in the lecture, but for now, let's, let's look at one of the ways manufacturers and system designers do that. And if you know that your mobile phone has quad core CPU, then the easy way of conserving battery is then most of the time you don't need the performance of a quad core. You can turn some of the cores off. So imagine that you turned three cores off and you're only running on a single core. Uh, simple tasks like, you know, checking email or uh, checking some notifications on the network and so on. Then you will be conserving, you know, less than 25% of the, of the power. Um, compared to using all four cores. So now most uh, systems do that. So they turn off cores which when the system is not busy and they enable the cores when the system becomes more busy. So switching cores on and off is a good strategy for conserving battery. But there is a problem with this strategy. So what, what is the problem? So that's one of the questions uh, I'm posing and we will discuss during the lecture and the way Apple went about this problem they decided that um, they will have a quad core design but in fact they will split it into two two core systems and they will have two high performance cores which are codenamed Hurricane and two low performance cores Zephyrs and the CPU will only use two at a time. So you can either be in a high performance mode and using the two high performance cores or you can be in low performance mode, high efficiency and uh, conserving battery in which case only two cores are running. So for the operating system and for the applications the A10 appears as if it is a single dual core system, not a quad core, just a dual core. Um, why? So why why Apple chose that? And as an as a side note, we also um, have to appreciate that the GPU, which is on A10, is a six core uh, GPU, very high performance um, uh, marvel of engineering, so to speak. All right, so there are two, two questions. Why it's preferable to have a single dual core system appearing to your OS and to your applications compared to a quad core CPU? And what is the problem of quad core CPU switching cores on and off uh, depending on the load to enable uh, battery conservation? Think about it. Okay, so some facts. Um, it is very likely that your mobile phone runs in excess of 2.2 GHz, probably 2.4, uh, and it is a quad-core. Um, even if you're using Apple, we kind of call it quad-core because there are effectively four cores, even though only two are used at a time. Um, the photo sensor is probably better than your old DSLR, and you may have a modern phone with storage bigger than um, the laptop. In fact, I, I have a three-year-old MacBook Air, uh, which I got at work, and it has less storage than my phone, which I got this year. Uh, half the storage on my portable MacBook compared to the phone, right? So my phone has more storage than my laptop. Um, it is very likely you're not making a lot of calls on your phone, um, but we still call it a phone. Uh, same, same with me, I, I have two phones. Um, one I use with the SIM card and I sometimes make calls and the other I don't even have a SIM card in it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of weird to call it a phone because I can't make phone, phone calls on it. Um, 
but we do use the device to stay in touch with our family and friends all the time, uh, even though we're not making calls per se. Um, so there is this kind of notion of being connected and, and being part of the community. And um, interestingly, even though the storage and CPU power enables us to do programming on the phone directly, we don't do it. Why? What are the reasons that we don't use our phones as a development machine for doing programming? So think about that. That's the second question for, for discussing during the class. And there is a lot of hype around wearables. So we have, you know, smart, smart bracelets, smart watches, smart rings. Uh, which measure a lot of our vitals and provide us information on the wrist. Uh, they usually work in combination with the smartphone, but there is this kind of a boom in terms of uh, miniaturization and um, ease of use. So is there future in wearables? Um, will they be used? for more than, you know, fitness tracking. Um, I don't know, so think, think a little bit about it. There is one nice video um, about a bracelet which kind of displays um, a kind of a smartphone UI on your wrist and you can interact with it. So those, those slides are posted on Piazza, you can uh, watch the video, I'm not gonna play the video here, but you're welcome to, to watch the video. So I, would like you to pause me and switch to the lecture notes and lecture slides and watch this uh, two minutes video about uh, this kind of a you know, concept bracelet. So let's pause. Okay, I hope you, you've watched the video. So let's, let's take a short detour about the, the video that you just watched about the bracelet. What do you think is wrong with this video? Well, you can pause this and, and think a little bit. Um, it went viral in 2014. It's not a new video. It's um, two or, or almost three years old. Uh, in 2015, the founders, four people from France, decided to launch a campaign, but they, they couldn't get funding. Um, and then this video resurfaced in 2016 again on Kickstarter uh, and then it was, it turned out that it wasn't the original um, people who, who made the video but some other people posted this guy's video to launch the campaign. So it was a scam effectively. But it's kind of a scam of the scam, right? I mean this bracelet um, it's physically impossible to, to achieve, right? So you can look up the miniature LED projectors, what the state of the art currently is, what's physically possible, what's not. Um, with this particular angle of projection, it will never be possible to display this type of image on your wrist, uh, unfortunately. So there is, you know, some serious problems um, with this type of hype and this type of um, uh, scam uh, possibilities. So I would like you to check a couple of things. Um, there is a possibility that if in the lecture I would tell you about this type of projection, you would potentially consider it as a truth, as a true information because I might be considered an expert in a field and by conveying some, some information, it's easier to mislead the people who are not as knowledgeable. Um, so there is this kind of well-known authority fallacy where you call up on some expert knowledge or some um, authority to convince someone to something that is not true. Um, there is another thing called association fallacy. So we discuss this massive growth of possibilities within the mobile technology. And by association, you may also believe 
things that are not true, like for example this bracelet thing. Um, so it kind of leads us to two things. One thing is that we want you to not believe anything anymore, right? So being a master student means that you're becoming sort of a scientist and researcher and by definition you are skeptical about what the common beliefs are and you always ask questions, you always question what you know and what other, what other people know and what information is being spread around. You need to make your beliefs on data, on evidence, not on hearsay, right? So you don't accept things for their face value, you always question things. So you always should question everything I tell you uh, because I might be wrong. Um, and that's your job now. You have to do that. Um, and the other thing is there is a number of cognitive biases that we have and it's kind of good as a researcher to be aware of them and try to mitigate them as much as possible to not fall victims of your own sort of uh, bias in rational thinking. So those are a couple of things I put links in in the slides and I would like you to check before the lecture so we can discuss it in the lecture as well. Okay, so now back to the actual lecture. Um, imagine that your smartphone has two terabytes of storage, which is, you know, 20 times more to what uh, Google Drive offers um, to you. It's, it's actually 200, 200 times more because uh, Google Drive offers you uh, 10 gig, right? So two tera is uh, 200 times more, not 20. And you may potentially run eight or more cores on the on your smartphone so you will have performance which is in excess of what you currently have on your laptop and you will have um, excellent gpu on it as well so most of it is already true so what does it mean what it means that you have in your hand or in your pocket something that is as powerful or more than your home pc um, well that's what we're trying to work out. We're trying to think what it means in the next generation mobile systems. What it means for cloud computing, for example. So if your device has two terabyte of storage, you know, how much storage would have a cloud service have to store customers' data? Um, is it feasible? Um, we'll have to think about it. So there's a number of questions which um, we sort of identified. So one is what are the inherent limitations of mobile computing? So the increasing speed and storage, those are not limitations. They will be growing and they will be reaching current cloud computing levels reasonably soon. Um, so the, you know, the ability for you to store 10 gig of free data on Google Drive that's nothing compared to your 256 gig that you can store on your mobile right now or more. Um, same with computing power. Of course, the servers and cloud, computer, cloud, cloud computing infrastructure will always be more powerful um, to deal with massive amount of data. But at the same time, your mobile device will be capable enough to do a lot and then if you think about hundreds or thousands of people living in, in Jovic, for example, and having those kind of capabilities, suddenly you can think of you know, Jovic citizens as an uh, infrastructure for a massive data cloud and massive processing. Um, so what does it mean? Okay, there was a question about um, turning cores on and off the, the, to conserve battery. What is the problem with that? Uh, and there was another question about why we cannot use mobiles for programming, even though technically we could. So list those reasons. Okay, and then the main theme of the lecture is what is the future of mobile computing? Um, and there is no single answer for that, of course. There, there are multiple answers. And one possible answer, which we will explore now, is this concept of participation. Um, so we will kind of do the second part of the lecture now um, and we'll talk a little bit about 
governance and use of technology for governance. So, you know, through Facebook and so on, you are already part of, of the community of one or the other way. Um, so you are participating in, you know, among your friends in voting on some funny things and so on. Um, but you don't really use it for serious things. We kind of use it for fun. Um, so Facebook allows you to like thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, funny photos of cats or something. Um, but you're not really using this mechanic, these capabilities for anything serious. Um, but what if you could? What if your local institutions like police or university or your government allowed you to interact with them through similar mechanic, through similar systems? So what if your mobile enabled you to participate in the, in the governance of your country or some local institutions? Well, that's kind of an interesting question, and that question is not new. Um, so this is a, you know, a quote from 69 um, by a non-technical person writing, predicting of what might have happened in 20, 30 years. So if you fast forward, you know, he talks about 1999, and we already 20 years past that almost. So the quote is, one marvels at the advancing technology of electronic computers, indicating devices and recording equipment. Some, in fact, have predicted that within 20 to or 30 years, every home will have a console tied into a computer upon which the children do their homework, the housewife will make uh, her grocery list, and the husband will pay the family bills. Such a computer console also could be used to record political decisions, giving each voter an opportunity to cast his ballot on every issue and have it recorded through the machine. What's interesting about this quote is that everything came true, right? So this, this author writes about a possibility of the technology being used for homework and being used for lectures and being used for doing shopping and paying bills. And we all do this every day. We use computers exactly for what he's saying. The only thing that haven't happened is the final part when he talks about participating in governance, um, that we can vote on things that matter through the use of technology. So I don't want to go into a questioning of why this hasn't happened. And it does um, uh, go a little bit outside of the technological realms. So in some countries, like in Estonia, you do have electronic voting and people do vote through computers. And that, that's not, technologically, that's not, you know, a problem. What is a problem is uh, adjusting the institutional and bureaucratic systems in the country to allow this to happen. So we will kind of disregard the, the, those social issues. We focus on the technology itself. So the technology which enables people to participate in a distributed and decentralized way with their governance is kind of interesting. So I would like you to think about it and think what it enables. And one thing that it enables is that you could have uh, different democratic models for governance compared to the uh, representative model that we currently use. So normally, democratic country works in a way that you vote on representatives which are elected for a particular period of four or five years and they do what they need to do or what they want to do and for the period of four to five years you have no say of what is actually happening. And the next time you have a say is when the election happens and you have an ability to vote on new representatives. But that's a very limited way of how you can influence the policies and how you can influence the workings of, of your government or your country. Um, so there is a concept called uh, liquid democracy. And it is quite interesting. So I would like you to read two papers. And those are not, you know, um, super important papers, but they describe the concept really well. And I've chosen those two papers because they, it's kind of interesting to compare them. So the first one is a diploma thesis. 
So you may think of it as sort of like a master thesis um, from a technical university. So it's from 2012 and it's quite long. So you don't need to read everything in all the details, but you can kind of scan through it and focus on the important parts of the, of the thesis. In particular, the use of technology, how you can achieve a liquid democracy and what liquid democracy means. So I would like you to read this. And then the second paper is about the same topic, but it's written by a PhD candidate, not a master's student, but rather a kind of a PhD researcher who is publishing in a journal some concepts related to the same topic of liquid democracy. Um, and I would like you to focus on some things. So one thing is I would like you to focus on the key concepts, list what the key concepts are in those two papers and how they are explained. Um, so you will list which concepts are there and which are the key concepts and what concepts are there but are not necessary, right? Um, and what it has to do with mobile, with mobile computing. So in particular, the first one, the <coughs> liquid democracy diploma thesis discusses more kind of a technology layer of how things can be implemented and it maps really well to, to um, mobile deployments. So I would like you to think, you know, how, how would that be possible? Um, then I would like you to think what are the main contributions? So what's novel? Uh, what those two articles bring in and also at which level. So is it very practical? Is it practically applied, kind of uh, research oriented? Or is it um, more conceptual and more abstract? How they tackle the problem? How do they describe it? How they explain what their contribution is? Um, and then I would like you to focus on the technology level, what's necessary to have this system actually working. Um, so those are kind of uh, semantics of, of the papers. I would like you also to, to look at them from the form, from the way they are written and explained. So what is similar and what's different in those two papers? Uh, how do they, how, I, how they are organized? Um, how easy is to read them? Is it very easy and kind of straightforward to follow and understand what is being explained um, and what have you learned? So some of the concepts and some of the things I'm sure you already know, uh, some you don't. And then you can learn those concepts from those two papers. So for example, you know, what is a Merkle tree and where, where do we use it for? Uh, you can learn it from the first paper. You can learn also what is a Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange algorithm. What is it for? Um, so there is a number of concepts that are sort of fundamental in computer science and in mobile computing or in distributed computing as such that um, those two papers explain and you can sort of list what di did you know before and you didn't learn new, new and what is new and you learn from the papers. So take some notes, uh, read those papers, um, and we will discuss we will discuss those two papers, and also we will discuss the the questions for the first part of the lecture in our session on on Thursday. So thank you very much, and I will see you on Thursday. Bye.